This is a one fall 30 minute time limit match. Gary Hart presents over to my right in the white corner weighing 287 pounds, the Dingo Warrior. James Brian Helwig was born June 16, 1959, in Crawfordsville, Indiana. James was the oldest of five children and did well with the responsibility of being the eldest in a large family, while also not losing sight of his own goals. At the age of 11, James wandered into the weight room at the local high school and decided to begin working out. That turned out to be an important decision, as seeing the changes in his own body as he grew older and began lifting weights more regularly, put him in the mindset that he had the power to change things in his own life. That mindset may have been a good thing to have just a year later when Jim's father left the family, and as the oldest, he did what he could to help his mother make ends meet. The loss of his father from the household led Jim to withdraw and come off as shy and insecure, but continuing to lift weights at Fountain Central High School helped Jim grow as an individual. His mother also remarried, and with a stepfather in the house that relocated the family to Petersburg, it took some of the strain off of a young Helwig. Jim's stepfather was also his introduction to pro wrestling. Though Jim was never a fan, he would sometimes come home to find his stepfather watching the World Wrestling Association on television. Jim never watched for more than a few moments, but would later say Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher stood out to him because of their gravelly voices. While Helwig enjoyed weightlifting and found success by winning a local weightlifting competition at the age of 18, his initial career aspirations were not related to athletics. After graduating high school and spending one year at Indiana State University, Helwig moved to Georgia to attend Life Chiropractic College in Marietta to become a doctor of chiropractic. While attending college, Jim met and married his first wife, Sherry, and continued his weight training, entering various bodybuilding competitions and even winning Mr. Georgia in 1984. That was enough to catch the eye of Gold's gym owner, Ed Connors, in California. Every year, Connors chose two men from across the country to come to California and train with bodybuilding legend Rich Gaspari to enter a national competition. Helwig was offered one of those spots. While he was only a couple of credits shy from graduating and beginning the next stage of his education, Jim saw this as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and decided to take a break from school. Though he didn't do as well as he had hoped in the bodybuilding competition, the decision to go to California changed Jim's future in other ways. Connors introduced Jim to Rick Bassman, a man some people described as an entrepreneur and others described as a hustler. Bassman had ties with various actors, athletes, and musicians, including Luke Ferrigno and the Go-Go's. Bassman had an idea to take four different men from four different backgrounds and present them to the World Wrestling Federation as a packaged team called Power Team USA. Helwig did not give up on his goal to be a chiropractor, but he did want to take all the work he had put into the gym and use it for something. Being under the false impression that everyone in pro wrestling made a lot of money, Helwig extended his break from school to try Bassman's plan. Taking the name Justice, Helwig arrived in California with three other aspiring wrestlers. Mark Miller, going by the name Commando, Garland Donahoe, going by the name Glory, and Steve Borden, going by the name Flash. Despite the fact notable veteran wrestler Red Bastine was there to help Bassman with training, it quickly became clear to Helwig Bassman was not as savvy to the business of pro wrestling as he had presented himself to be while making his pitch. When they were getting work, Helwig was surprised by the small payouts, sometimes making as little as $20. Shortly after the group formed, both Donahoe and Miller quit, but Helwig and Borden made the faithful decision to stay. Making long road trips and sometimes going into grocery stores to eat right in the aisle as they had little to no money, Helwig and Borden traveled across California in a business they didn't know, being sent by someone who also didn't know the business very well. Helwig would later say his ignorance about the business was something of a blessing, as they didn't know how bad things were at the time. At that point, even if Helwig wanted to quit and go back to school, he didn't have the money to get back to Georgia. Eventually, Bassman did come through for Helwig and Borden and contacted Jerry Jarrett in Memphis. By late 1985, the still green team of Justice and Flash were getting their big break in the Continental Wrestling Association, as the Freedom Fighters. 
Making their CWA debut as babyfaces on November 23, 1985, the Freedom Fighters defeated the team of The Invader and David Johnson on Memphis television. Showing none of the fire and charisma that would eventually mark both of their careers, Helwig and Borden made it obvious they were a little different than what Memphis fans were accustomed to at the time with a powerhouse style. It was also obvious to the wrestlers in the back that the two were painfully inexperienced in the ring. It wouldn't take long for the powers that be in Memphis to recognize Justice and Flash were not going to work as babyfaces with a crowd that was accustomed to tag teams like the Fabulous Ones. Just two weeks into their Memphis run, the Freedom Fighters turned heel, coming out to complain to announcer Lance Russell on television that they weren't already at the top of the card. Helwig claimed their bodies alone were reason enough for them to be getting title shots, naming Jerry Lawler and Phil Hickerson as fat wrestlers who never saw the inside of a gym. Hickerson came out to confront the two, telling them the only reason they hadn't been getting matches against champions like Lawler was because they were green and couldn't wrestle, proving that injecting a little truth into it is often the best promo. Hickerson challenged Justice to get in the ring while Flash stood at ringside. When Hickerson started getting the best of the rookie, Flash interfered, and the Freedom Fighters beat down Hickerson until Steve Kern came from the back to chase them away. The Freedom Fighters would get their wish, facing Lawler and Austin Idol for the AWA Southern Tag Team Championship on December 16, 1985, at the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis. The veterans retained their titles in what Lawler later called a frustrating match, as he found out firsthand how green the two rookies were. Helwig and Borden went on to have a series of matches against the Fantastics and did win a few squash matches against Enhancement Talon over the next month. While things were not going that well in Memphis, Helwig later said there were positives as both he and Warden were starting to learn a business in which they were not properly trained or prepared. Helwig named Rip Morgan, Tommy Rogers, and Dutch Mantell as the wrestlers that did the most to help guide them. The lessons would be brief as the CWA was starting to see the writing on the wall. The Freedom Fighters simply didn't fit in with the style of Memphis wrestling, and Helwig and Borden needed somewhere to go to properly gain experience. Instead of just casting them off and sending them back to California, Jerry Jarrett contacted Bill Watts in Mid-South Wrestling. Watts was known for using bigger wrestlers with a rougher style. Watts agreed to take the two wrestlers, but repackaged them once they came to Louisiana. Watts would rename the tag team the Blade Runners and put them with manager wrestler Eddie Gilbert making them an obvious and unapologetic knockoff of the Road Warriors. Both wrestlers would get new names as well, with Helwig being renamed Rock and Borden taking the name Sting. Coming into the territory in a transitional period, the Blade Runners only appeared on one Mid-South card where they defeated Perry Jackson and Steve Dahl at the Fairground Pavilion in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Shortly thereafter, Mid-South officially broke away from the National Wrestling Alliance and formed a Universal Wrestling Federation. The change in name didn't change the plan for Rock and Sting as they tore through a series of enhancement talent and lower mid-carters through March and April of 1986, even besting the notable team of Chavo Guerrero and Terry Taylor in Alexandria, Louisiana at the end of April. Though they had gained some experience, the same problems persisted. Watts wanted to use the Road Warrior blueprint and make the Blade Runners a dominating team, striking fear at the top of the card. The road was supposed to lead to the UWF Tag Team Championship, but Rock and Sting were still not showing the development in the ring Watts had hoped. The shine started to come off the Blade Runners in May 1986 when they started going to head-to-head -head against teams like Steve Williams and Ted DiBiase and coming out on the losing end. The pair didn't fare any better in singles competition, with Rock losing all of his one-on-one -on -one matchups. Things came apart for Helwig and the UWF after a minor confrontation with Bill Watts in the locker room. During the back and forth, Borden seemingly took Watts' side, leaving Helwig feeling somewhat betrayed. Helwig later said that up to that point, they had always agreed to have each other's back, and felt Borden had decided to take his own path. The Blade Runners had their last match together on June 14, 1986, at the UWF Superdome Extravaganza in New Orleans, losing to the fabulous Freebirds Buddy Roberts and Terry Gordy. Two weeks later, Helwig left the UWF and traveled to Dallas-Fort Worth and the World Class Wrestling Association. Arriving at the Will Rogers Memorial Coliseum in Fort Worth on June 30th, 1986, Helwig had no idea of what World Class had planned for him. World Class was going to bring Helwig in with something of a splash, as he was going to be in Percy Pringle's stable of wrestlers, making his first appearance in the tag team with veteran Matt Bourne against the notable team of Lance Von Erich and Bruiser Brody. No longer part of the Blade Runners, a name like Rock apparently wouldn't work without his partner Sting. Mm-hmm. 
While going over things for his first match, according to Helwig, someone standing nearby said he looked like a warrior. After tossing around various words to go with warrior, they finally decided on using the word dingo, just because it sounded good at the time. Dingo Warrior's world-class debut ended in a loss to Von Erich and Brody, but world-class fans immediately took note of the newcomer with the amazing physique. While working with veterans like Bourne, Buzz Sawyer, and Rick Rude in Prinkle Stable could have been beneficial to Warrior, he wasn't getting along with Bourne and Sawyer, causing some real-life conflict. World-class also couldn't ignore the fact that Dingo was quickly gaining popularity with fans, despite being a heel. Just over a month after coming to Dallas, World Class dipped their toe in the waters of a Dingo Warrior face turn by starting a heel versus heel feud between Dingo and Rude. During the tag match against Kevin and Mike Von Erich, Rude got the team disqualified by hitting referee Ralph Pulley while in Kevin's iron claw. Dingo became visibly upset with Rude, and it turned into a shoving match between the two outside the ring as fans began a Dingo chant. Warrior moved over to Gary Hart's stable, primarily tagging with Abdullah the Butcher and still taking on the likes of Kevin Von Erich and Brian Adias, while also facing off against Rude and Grudge matches. Warrior was also kept firmly planted as a heel with fans by having him turn on his tag partner Sako during the World Tag Team Championship Tournament on September 1st, 1986. Sako was actually Mark Miller, one of the members of Power Team USA in California that left the group early in training. Warrior beat down his partner after Sako was pinned to lose to Lance Von Erich and Chris Adams in the semifinals, and we never saw Sako again. Warrior was proving to be the fan favorite in his matches against Rude, and despite heelish behavior, was getting a growing favorable reaction from fans during other matches. It was clear a face turn was needed. Quietly, Gary Hart stopped accompanying Dingo to the ring. In a September 19, 1986 match at the Sportatorium in Dallas, Dingo found himself in the awkward position of tagging with former stablemates Matt Bourne and Buzz Sawyer as they challenged for the WCWA World Six-Man Tag Team Championship against champions Kevin, Mike, and Lance Von Erich. Things went well enough until the Von Erichs got the upper hand on Warrior and kept him in the ring for an extended period of time. Working against Kevin, Dingo managed to get within arm's reach of Sawyer and Bourne and reached out for a tag. Both Sawyer and Bourne refused to tag into the match, as a stunned Percy Pringle looked on. Kevin would pull Dingo back to the Von Erich corner and eventually pin Warrior with a crossbody off the top rope. As the Von Erichs left the ring, Dingo was confronted by Pringle, who, despite acting surprised by Sawyer and Bourne's actions, verbally laid into the Warrior and blamed him for the loss. Warrior snapped, grabbing Percy's cane and disposing of the manager before taking on both Sawyer and Bourne. Warrior was left standing alone in the ring as the crowd cheered. And Dingo settled into his role as a babyface, also making things easier in the dressing room. Warrior had a good relationship with the Von Erichs, particularly Kerry Von Erich, who shared Warrior's passion for working out. In the ring, Warrior developed a fast friendship with Steve Simpson, who partnered with Dingo against Sawyer and Bourne in an attempt to win the WCWA World Tag Team Championship at the Cotton Bowl Extravaganza on October 12th. The duo fell short of winning the titles, but Warrior wasn't done chasing the belts just yet. Dingo tagged with various combinations of Devon Erics and Bruiser Brody as the feud against Pringle's men went into November. After Dingo came to the aid of Lance Von Erich, who had been attacked by a chain-wielding Buzz Sawyer, the two joined forces to go after the tag championship. A wrench would be thrown into things when Sawyer abruptly left World Class, leaving behind his half of the world tag titles. A new member of Pringle's stable, Master G, would step in for Sawyer, as he and Bourne defended against Warrior and Lance on November 17th in Fort Worth. Dingo and Lance won the World Tag titles, marking the first championship in Warrior's career, and leading into a short series of matches between Dingo and Master G. That series culminated in Warrior winning a chain match at the 1986 Thanksgiving Day Star Wars card at Reunion Arena in Dallas. The World Tag title reign turned out to be a short one, as Warrior and Von Erich dropped the belts to Brian Adias and Al Madrill on December 1st in Fort Worth, but what future Warrior had in World Class would primarily be in singles competition. Buzz Sawyer's departure also left the Texas Heavyweight Championship vacant. On January 12, 1987, the tournament consisting of four rounds was held at World Rogers Memorial Center in Fort Worth to crown a new Texas Heavyweight Champion. Dingo defeated Master G in the first round, drew a bye in the second round, and disposed of nemesis Matt Bourne in the third round. Unfortunately, Warrior fell short winning the tournament, losing to Bob Bradley in the final round. 
However, he would not have to wait long to win the first singles title of his career. Bradley's first defense of the Texas title was against Warrior at the February 2, 1987 Star Wars card at Tarrant County Convention Center in Fort Worth. Warrior won the match and the title, but even bigger things were going on behind the scenes. Things were not going well in World Class at the time. Only three months after World Class broke away from the National Wrestling Alliance, Booker Ken Mantell jumped ship and started working for the Universal Wrestling Federation. In fact, Mantell and Warrior practically passed each other on Interstate 20 as Mantell headed to Louisiana and Warrior came to Dallas. Mantell then harvested many of the top names from World Class and brought them to the UWF. Going into the spring of 1987, the roster in Dallas was very small and attendance was starting to fall. When Warrior went to World Class owner Fritz Von Erich to see about making more money, that request was quickly denied. Warrior liked working in the territory, but he was hoping to move his career to the next level, as well as start a family. Warrior had already filled in an offer from New Japan Pro Wrestling, who wanted to bring him in to play a character called Big Band Vader, and were offering a nice sum of money to do so. While Warrior mulled over the decision to move to Japan, an unexpected offer came in that allowed him to stay in the United States. George Scott, a one-time wrestler and longtime figure behind the scenes in various promotions, had come in to replace Mantell. Scott's time there was a turbulent one, with an apparent conflict with Gary Hart leading to his departure in late 1986. However, before he left, he contacted Vince McMahon and the World Wrestling Federation, where he worked prior to coming to World Class. Scott simply gave McMahon a heads up on Dingo Warrior, telling him to keep an eye on him. Before the summer of 1987, Vince McMahon made contact with Warrior. Dingo's final few weeks in World Class were not without their excitement. Warrior defended the Texas title against the likes of Matt Bourne and Black Bart, and entered into a feud with Nord the Barbarian. By the middle of June 1987, with Warrior not seeing eye to eye with new Booker Bruiser Brody, it came time to accept Vince McMahon's invitation. The Texas title changed hands in the Phantom match, with fans being told Al Perez defeated Warrior in Puerto Rico, in reality, Warrior's last official match for World Class came on June 12, 1987 at the Swordatorium in Dallas. In a six-man tag match, the Rock and Roll RPMs, Tommy Lane and Mike Davis, tagged with Ted Arcidi against Warrior, Tony Atlas, and, interestingly, a recently turned babyface Matt Bourne. The RPMs and Arcidi won the match, and Warrior was off to the WWF. Wanting to give Warrior a test run in spot shows before bringing him to television, Dingo's first WWF match was on June 17, 1987, in Wichita Falls, Texas, followed by appearances in Waco and Odessa. Warrior won all three matches over Steve Lombardi, and with Dingo already a popular figure in world class, fans in Texas gave him a huge reaction. Fan reception in Texas led the WWF to quickly bring Warrior East, working dark matches for televised events, and a regular series of spot shows through the rest of the summer. Dingo Warrior made his first WWF appearance on August 15, 1987, at the Boston Garden in Boston, Massachusetts, against Barry Horowitz. While Horowitz would get a little offense in during the six-minute or so match, it was mostly what WWF fans would come to be very familiar with. Warrior manhandled Horowitz, pinning the veteran after a running splash. WWF fans had been introduced to Dingo Warrior, but that is not how they would know him for long. Vince McMahon liked the Dingo Warrior gimmick, but he didn't like the name. When Warrior was preparing for his wider television debut on Wrestling Challenge against Terry Gibbs in October 1987, Vince wanted him to do a short pitcher-in-pitcher -pitcher promo that would run during the match. Vince told Helwig to say Warrior, but not to say Dingo. In the promo, Jim referred to himself as the Ultimate Warrior. Vince stopped everything on the spot and declared that that was the name they would use. Ultimate Warrior was born. Warrior continued to win squash matches over enhancement talent through the rest of 1987, with sporadic appearances on television, though he apparently wasn't ready for prime time as he worked dark matches for Saturday night's main event. By November, he was starting to pick up wins over more notable talent, like Jim Neidhart and Harley Race. Meanwhile, Warrior developed a good working relationship with Vince McMahon behind the scenes, Warrior is even credited with getting McMahon to step up his own workout routine, which became evident with the Mr. McMahon character a few years later. And going into 1988, Warrior was getting closer to stepping on the big stage in the WWF. And two low-key feuds with Andre the Giant and Hercules led to Warrior's first WrestleMania match during WrestleMania 4 at the Trump Plaza Convention Center in Atlantic City, New Jersey. 
Warrior made short work of Hercules at WrestleMania, defeating the Heenan family member in four and a half minutes. That was followed by a series of matches against Hercules at spot and house shows, with several matches against Andre mixed in. The matches against Andre and Hercules were essentially just two huge guys going at each other, but they did lead to an unusual feud for Warrior with their manager, Bobby Heenan. Heenan was the mouthpiece for both wrestlers, and his words finally got him in the ring for a series of loser wears a weasel suit matches at house shows through the summer of 1988. The final match took place on July 31st at WWF WrestleFest in Milwaukee. Warrior won all of the matches, with most of them taking just under five minutes, and ending with Warrior putting Heenan down with a sleeper. Warrior then took the weasel suit and put it on Heenan, who finally arose from the sleeper to find himself in the suit. Heenan was such a big heel with WWF fans it gave Warrior another level of popularity to humiliate the manager and set the table for the next chapter in Ultimate Warrior's WWF story. Shortly after Warrior's match against Heenan at WrestleFest, the Honky Tonk Man became the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time, officially passing Pedro Morales' mark of 424 days on August 8, 1988. On August 15th, Honky Tonk began a series of defenses against Ultimate Warrior at house shows in the U.S. and Canada, all of which Warrior won by disqualification. This was leading up to Honky Tonk's title defense against Brutus Beefcake at the August 29th SummerSlam pay-per-view at Madison Square Garden. With Warrior's increasing popularity, plans were changed. In storyline, Beefcake suffered an injury after being attacked by Ron Bass and had to miss SummerSlam 88. An overconfident Honky Tonk showed up for the pay-per-view not knowing who his opponent would be and wouldn't allow Gene Okerlund to tell him or the audience, wanting it to be a surprise for everyone. When Honky Tonk arrived in the ring with manager Jimmy Hart, he was full of confidence. The confidence disappeared when the Ultimate Warriors music hit and the crowd erupted. Warrior ran to the ring and ended Honky Tonk's record-setting reign at 453 days, pinning him in just 31 seconds before Honky Tonk could even get his jumpsuit off. Only the second singles title of his career and third overall, Warrior was the new Intercontinental Heavyweight Champion and a bona fide superstar. Warrior successfully defended the IC title in return matches against Honky Tonk through the rest of 1988, including no disqualification in cage matches. Going into 1989, there was a wider variety of opponents with matches against Greg Valentine, Ted DiBiase, and several against King Haku. In February 1989, Warrior got his first shots at the WWF World Championship in a series of title versus title matches against champion Randy Savage, all of which Savage won by countout. Eventually, Warrior entered what might be his overall best feud in the WWF with a familiar face. Rick Rude, who Warrior had worked with in World Class three years earlier, was the opponent in an IC title match at WrestleMania V in Atlantic City. Warrior worked well with Rude and had some of his longest matches against him. Rude was also a member of the Heenan family, once again putting Warrior on the opposite side of the ring from Bobby Heenan. Warrior had the upper hand against Rude through most of the matches, tossing the ravishing one around the ring like a rag doll. Rude did have his moments on offense, but it was clear Warrior was simply overpowering Rude. When Warrior tried to suplex Rude from the ring apron into the ring, Heenan grabbed Warrior's foot, causing Warrior to fall with Rude landing on top. Heenan held Warrior's leg while Rude got the three count and took the Intercontinental title. Through the summer of 1989, Warrior had a great series of matches against Rude as he tried to regain the Intercontinental Championship. Most of the matches ended in a disqualification or countout, but it was all to lead to the payoff at SummerSlam 1989 on August 28th in East Rutherford, New Jersey. That match may very well have been the greatest match in Warrior's career. Rude started the match with a defensive mindset, doing his best simply to stay away from Warrior. Eventually, the two would lock up, with Warrior dominating early, but Rude coming back to get some near pins. When the two collided in the ring and both went down, referee Joey Morello was caught in the middle and knocked out. This set the stage for a nail-biting finish. Warrior had Rude pinned in the middle of the ring, but there was no referee to make the count. Once Morello did come around, Rude managed to get his foot on the bottom rope to stop the pin. After Warrior and Rude exchanged pile drivers, Rude managed to get the advantage in the match, but Warrior continually kicked out of pin attempts. Suddenly, Rowdy Roddy Piper came to ringside. Piper and Rude had been having problems with each other, and when Rude noticed Piper, it drew his attention away from the match. Rude taunted Piper with his hip swiveling, but Piper responded by raising his kilt and mooning Rude. 
descent Root into a rage, allowing Warrior to come up behind him and gain the advantage in the match. After a running splash, Warrior won the match and regained the Intercontinental title. Warrior was now a two-time Intercontinental Champion with rabid support from the fans. Meanwhile, fan support for WWF Champion Hulk Hogan, who had regained the title in April, was still high but was experiencing a noticeable dip, at least enough of a dip to make Vince McMahon decide to make changes. After regaining the IC title, Warrior began a series of defenses against Andre the Giant. Most of the matches over the three month span were over quickly, some of them lasting as little as 20 seconds. But it was a 9 minute and 28 second match at Madison Square Garden on September 30th, 1989, early in the series, that was the actual key. Andre had been presented as the immovable object to Hulk Hogan's unstoppable force leading up to their WrestleMania 3 match two years earlier. Hogan slamming Andre was not only an iconic moment that is still used in various ways today, it was also symbolic of recognizing Hogan was now the face of wrestling in the WWF. Two years later, in that match at Madison Square Garden, Ultimate Warrior slammed Andre the Giant. The fact that Warrior won the match was not the significant part. The fact he slammed Andre made many fans wonder where it was going to lead next. Two baby faces feuding with each other is a rarity, but that's where the WWF was going with Warrior and Hogan. Things were given a little spice by the fact that there was a real-life rivalry of sorts, with Warrior seeing the money Hogan was making, and Hogan seeing Warrior's popularity surpass his. It started subtly enough at the Royal Rumble on January 21st, 1990 in Orlando. With both Warrior and Hogan in the ring having eliminated everyone else up to that point, they found themselves face to face in the middle of the ring. The crowd reaction made it clear this was something they wanted to see. Hogan went on to win the Royal Rumble, but it was just the beginning of setting things up between the two. On the next Saturday night's main event, Warrior and Hogan tagged with each other against Mr. Perfect and the Genius. There was no animosity shown between the two ultra-popular champions prior to the match, and the two went on to win. However, Perfect and Genius attacked Warrior and Hogan after the bell, and in the mayhem, Warrior accidentally clotheslined Hogan. A little more than some pushing and shoving between the two took place in the ring, but after the match, Hogan issued the ultimate challenge, wanting a title-for-title title match with Warrior at WrestleMania VI at Toronto Skydome on April 1st. Warrior accepted in his own unique way, and the stage was set. Both Warrior and Hogan received positive reactions from the crowd during their ring entrance, making it tough to tell who the crowd favorite was going to be. The match itself consisted mostly of stare-downs and tests of strength, but it was the ending that hit all the right chords, as for the first time, fans genuinely weren't sure how a Hogan title defense was going to end. Just when it seemed a new champion was going to be crowned after Warrior pressed Hogan and hit him with a running splash, Hogan kicked out and started the classic hulking up. In a matter of seconds, it looked like Hogan would retain as the fans saw the same scene they had seen hundreds of times, with Hogan giving Warrior the big boot and then moving in for the leg drop. But this time, Warrior moved. Warrior hit Hogan with another splash and pinned the champion clean in the middle of the ring. Ultimate Warrior was the new WWF World Champion. In many ways, it was also the beginning of the end of his career. One problem with having a babyface versus babyface title change in the WWF was the new champion came in facing the same people as the old one. Warrior had decent matches against the likes of Randy Savage, Mr. Perfect, and especially Rick Rude, but it was all something fans had seen before. Not only had Hogan faced all the same wrestlers, but Warrior had his battles and feuds with the same foes previously. Warrior's cage match against Rick Rude at SummerSlam 1990 in Philadelphia was a memorable matchup, but otherwise, more attention seemed to be given to a series of tag matches teaming Warrior with Kerry Von Erich against Rude and Mr. Perfect as the two feuds were put in one ring. Warrior also had a series of six-man tags where he tagged with the Legion of Doom against Demolition. Warrior also teamed with both the Legion of Doom and Von Erich at Survivor Series as they defeated Demolition and Mr. Perfect. Warrior did have a great series of matches against Randy Savage in late 1990 and early 1991, but there just seemed to be something missing. Maybe it was the high concentration of tag matches, maybe it was the repetitive opponents. There's a strong possibility it was simply the fact that once the fans got what they thought they wanted, they didn't really want it anymore. It was about the moment Warrior won, and the moment was over. When fan interest was leaning more toward Hulk Hogan's match against Earthquake at SummerSlam than towards Warrior's title defense against Rude, it was the first sign that maybe fans weren't done with Hogan just yet. 
Nine months after winning the WWF Championship, Ultimate Warrior defended against Sergeant Slaughter at the 1991 Royal Rumble in Miami. Randy Savage manager Sensational Sherry tried to interfere in the match, but was stopped by Warrior, who then deposited Sherry on top of Savage, who had come to ringside. While Warrior dealt with Savage and Sherry, Slaughter came up behind him and planted a knee in his back, causing him to fall into the ropes. As the ref pushed Slaughter back, the Macho King Savage bashed Warrior over the head with his scepter. Slaughter pulled Warrior away from the ropes and pinned him, ending Warrior's title reign. Warrior faced off against Slaughter in a series of rematches over the next several weeks, leading up to WrestleMania 7 in Los Angeles. But it would be Hogan who faced Slaughter for the title on the WWF's biggest stage. Warrior would face Randy Savage in a Loser Must Retire match at that WrestleMania, but that match is best remembered for the reunion of Savage and Miss Elizabeth. While feuding with The Undertaker in a series of body bag and casket matches, Ultimate Warrior made a bold move. In a letter to Vince McMahon, Warrior demanded to renegotiate his contract, asking for more pay on par with Hulk Hogan, plus a sizable bonus and a higher percentage of merchandise sales. Among other things, Warrior also wanted the boost to his pay for WrestleMania 7. If he didn't receive the higher pay for WrestleMania, he would refuse to show up for SummerSlam 1991, where he was scheduled to tag with Hogan in a handicap match against Sergeant Slaughter, Colonel Mustafa, and General Adnan. That match had already been advertised to fans. McMahon paid Warrior for the higher amount for WrestleMania so he would appear at SummerSlam, but immediately after the match, when Warrior walked backstage, McMahon handed him a letter telling him he would be suspended for unprofessional behavior, which also canceled the planned feud with Jake Roberts. It was a trying time for Warrior. His first marriage was coming to an end, and his name had also come up in rumors about steroids at a time the federal government was zeroing in on the WWF. Warrior asked for his release from the company, but McMahon refused. Warrior served his suspension and did make a memorable return at WrestleMania 8 to save Hulk Hogan from a beatdown by Sid Justice and Papa Shango. The plan was for Warrior to eventually turn on Hogan and align himself with Mr. Perfect, but Warrior refused to turn heel. As it turned out, the return would not last to the end of the year. Another suspension came in November of 1992, this time due to several failed drug tests and accusations that he used steroids. After making an appearance for the Independent International Wrestling Federation in January 1993 using the name Ultimate Warrior, the WWF sent a cease and desist letter telling Helwig they owned the name Ultimate Warrior and he could not use it. In response, Helwig filed papers to legally change his name to Warrior, first appearing in the ring simply as The Warrior during a two-week run in Germany for World Wrestling Superstars in April 1993. Eventually, after several lawsuits, courts found that Warrior could legally use the name as well as anything associated with the gimmick. Warrior seemed to have moved on from wrestling, or at least the WWF. He opened a gym and wrestling school in Arizona, and even started his own comic book centered on the Warrior character. Warrior did make a few appearances in independent promotions in 1995 and 1996, but there would be one more round with the WWF. After some heated and sometimes bizarre negotiations, Ultimate Warrior rose from the ashes one last time at WrestleMania 12 in Anaheim, defeating Herner Hurst Helmsley in less than two minutes. However, the reemergence of Warrior would not last long. Warrior began no-showing events, leading Vince McMahon to release him for the final time. Warrior made his last appearance for the WWF on June 25, 1996, defeating Vader by countout in a dark match during the taping of WWF Superstars. Two years later, the Warrior would briefly return to the national spotlight. Popping up in World Championship Wrestling, Warrior was on a collision course with the former Hulk, now Hollywood, Hogan. Warrior's brief run in WCW was a bit lackluster, but it did provide a cool moment when, for one night, Warrior reunited with Sting in a tag match on WCW Monday Nitro at United Center in Chicago. The former Blade Runners defeated the team of Bret Hart and Hollywood Hogan by disqualification. After Warrior had his match against Hogan at the Halloween Havoc pay-per-view on October 25, 1998, which was a complete botch fest, his WCW run was over. In 1999, Warrior announced his official retirement. Over the next few years, Warrior settled into life away from wrestling. He married again, with his wife Dana taking the surname Warrior. Together they had two daughters who went on to achievements of their own in activities like dance and martial arts. However, there would be one final time for Warrior in the ring. 
On June 25, 2008, almost 10 years after the match at Halloween Havoc, Warrior had his final match in Barcelona, Spain for New Wrestling Evolution. Warrior defeated Orlando Jordan in just over 17 minutes to win the NWE World Heavyweight Championship with his wife and young daughters in attendance. It was the only time his daughters got to see him in the ring. He would relinquish the title after the match. To put it very lightly, Warrior rubbed a lot of people the wrong way during his wrestling career. Bobby Heenan, Bret Hart, Hulk Hogan, and many others have had some harsh stories to tell about Warrior in and out of the ring. That makes the final chapter in Warrior's story that much more amazing and heartbreaking. After 18 years away from the company now known as World Wrestling Entertainment, Warrior was welcomed back for his induction into the WWE Hall of Fame on April 5, 2014. More importantly, Warrior mended fences with many people backstage, including Vince McMahon, Jake Roberts, and Hulk Hogan. On April 6th, Warrior made an appearance at WrestleMania 30 in New Orleans, and on April 7th, appeared and spoke to the crowd during Monday Night Raw, also in New Orleans. It was Warrior's last public appearance. On April 8th, after flying to Arizona, Warrior was walking to his car with his wife just before 6 p.m., less than 24 hours after his appearance on Raw. Warrior suddenly clutched his chest and collapsed. Warrior was rushed to the hospital where he was pronounced dead at the age of 54. An autopsy later revealed he died from a heart attack. The whiplash of emotions over a 72-hour period left Warrior fans across the country stunned. Their childhood hero was finally back, but then suddenly gone forever. The wrestlers Warrior had just reconnected with were glad they were able to make peace with him, but saddened it would be the final act. In 2015, the WWE announced the Warrior Award as part of their Hall of Fame presentation. The award went to someone who exhibited unwavering strength and perseverance and embodied the spirit of the Ultimate Warrior. The inaugural award was posthumously given to Conor Mihalik and presented by Warrior's wife Dana. There is no doubt Warrior was something of a polarizing figure at the height of his career, but it should also be pointed out he had his defenders. His relationships with the likes of Kerry Von Erich and Owen Hart were always good, and Jim Powers remained friends with Warrior years after their careers were over. Perhaps announcer Sean Mooney gave the best glimpse of the man behind the character when he said you never knew what warrior you were going to get. He could be in a corner brooding, then an hour later he was down on one knee talking to a young fan. If you knew him as Jim Helwig, Justice, Rock, Dingo Warrior, Ultimate Warrior, or simply Warrior, it was a unique journey through professional wrestling for the kid from Indiana. What started as, I'll try this for a bit, led to being, arguably, the most popular figure in pro wrestling just over five years later. It was a meteoric rise with a character that continues in the hearts of wrestling fans today. If you were a world-class fan, then you were lucky enough to see the foundation of that phenomenon and the early stages of something that, for a brief period of time, took over the wrestling world. We just have a little different perspective on it. Bingo will strike a few poses to show off his incredible physique. Go ahead, Bingo. Ah! Hey, what the... Do you respect me, Joe? Bingo! I never get to wear a suit like yours, Joe. Bingo, put me down and I'll make you an incredible bargain like this. A new 1989 Ranger S for a low, low $67.95. Thanks, little buddy. Bubba West Wayfold. Arts and Service open till midnight Monday through Friday.